world where Neil Gaiman watches the trailer for the first season of The Sandman. We ask him to explain every shot. Okay. Now here we get to see Tom Sturridge plays Morpheus, the King of Dreams, the Prince of Stories. Tom was in the first email we got from casting and we went, oh my gosh, Tom is the best, Tom is magnificent. And then we saw 1,500, 2,000 Morpheuses and there was no one who was Tom. He had gravity. He could actually make you believe that he was a billions of years old entity, somebody who existed in dreams that he wasn't human. Your waking world is shaped. So that first shot, which I think is incredibly beautiful, we have Morpheus next to Matthew the Raven looking out at hell. I love the color. I love the bleakness. I love the sky for that particular shot. We are actually in a incredibly digitally enhanced bit of England on some real grassland. We had some a little smoke and stuff, but we added to it and we just made it hell. Your waking world is shaped by dreams. One of the things I love about this moment is you can see the moving body parts. It always makes me think of Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast, where you enter the Beast Castle and there are these arms coming out of the walls holding candelabras, which they did by having people standing on the other side of the wall with their hands through holes. And of course, we're doing the same thing here. When I was writing Hell, Hell was this place that all of the people who ever thought they should be in hell had gone. It was made up of them as much as it was anything else. So for me, this is just sort of part and parcel of the same thing. These are all people. The whole thing is made up of people. Hell is people. Dreams. I love this shot because it's a place called The Threshold and it's where desire lives. On the one hand, it really reproduces the comic. Some beautiful Mike Dringenberg and later some Mark Hempel images that we went to. We tried reproducing the comics exactly and it didn't quite work. And then we had to think, okay, well, how will it work? How does the heart hang in the chest? What position are the arms in that doesn't make it look goofy, that doesn't make it look weird with a real person? We just see it for a moment here, but seeing Desire's home, the threshold, makes me very happy. Dreams and nightmares that I create and which I must control. Now this shot, it's exactly the same shot as the comics, although it is flipped. We knew that moment was going to be important, and that's the moment where Morpheus, who has been imprisoned for over a hundred years, finally out of his cage and returning to the dreaming. The comics were always the Bible. Sometimes they were more the Old Testament. We'd let things change, but the things that changed tended to change with the times or with the need to make something into television. Other than that, we'd look at things and go, well, if it isn't broken, we aren't going to fix it. And that was our first shot of the castle, of the dreaming. The thing about the castle in the comics is it always changes. It changes issue to issue. It's the castle of dreams, so it looks like whatever it needs to look like at that moment. And here we actually had to pick a look to be able to go, okay, this is the look when it's a fabulous, thriving, happy place, and this is the look when it's destroyed. He's out there looking for me, isn't he? Can you imagine the damage he could do? Lucien is the only character that I can think of where we'd actually intentionally gender swapped a character. I had populated the dreaming with characters from old DC Comics horror anthology titles. Lucien came from a comic called, if memory serves, Tales of Ghost Castle. Morpheus needs characters around him who can be honest with him and tell him things for his own good and tell him when he's screwing up, which he can then ignore. Can you imagine the damage he could do? I need your help. Dreams disappear, then so will humanity. 
I could do without dreams for a while. Now, what is interesting about this is this is the amazing Jenna Coleman. Got the role of Joanna Constantine after we'd auditioned some amazing actresses who were not giving us whatever that indefinable Constantine spark is. And she did. People say, ah, you gender swapped Constantine. And I'm like, no, I didn't. I knew that I was going to have my Lady Joanna Constantine sequences in the past. And I knew that for somebody coming in and just watching Sandman Cold with no DC Comics back knowledge or whatever, the information that she was the ancestor of the character that we had met in episode three would really mean nothing at all. The idea of an 18th century version of this character on the run in the French Revolution with a severed head, that one I could get into. So it immediately when we were looking for our Constantine, that was the way that we went. I love the weird kind of spark that we see between Morpheus and Constantine because he is actually slightly more polite with her, I suspect, than he would have been with a male alternative. One of the things that is, is a little difficult with Sandman and DC Comics is where Sandman intersected with DC Comics. For example, we have the Martian Manhunter and Mr. Miracle, two characters who happen to be in the Justice League in 1989. So really what we tended to do was if it's a character that we're likely to meet again, if it's a character who is going to wander through the story, then we take a look at how to incorporate them, what we're doing to incorporate them. And sometimes we don't necessarily do it in ways that you'd expect. For a while, I haven't had a decent night's sleep in ages. I'm not going to stop. And that is the glorious David Thewlis. David Thewlis plays John D. He's a man who has spent the majority of his life in maximum security mental hospital, but with armed guards. And unfortunately, he's out with the ruby that he used to do terrible things before. 24 Hours, which is Sandman issue six, which we translated into episode five of the TV series, is the darkest comic I think I've ever written. And terrible things happen to some people. Biggest challenge was making something that people would keep watching and wait to see how it ended and come back for the episode after. The other challenge was we have to spend longer setting the story up than we did in the comic and spend longer just getting to know these people and getting to love them because that's what makes it matter. That's what makes you willing to spend the rest of the time with them. Stop until I've reshaped this world. What power have... We get to meet Lucifer, Lucifer Morningstar, Lord of Hell, played here by the unbelievably awesome Gwendolyn Christie. This will be the third place where people say, did you gender swap this character? And I say, of course not. The original Lucifer didn't have a gender, so merely getting them played by a human actor is technically gender swapping them either way. What we wanted was the quality that the Lucifer in the comic has a androgyny based around early David Bowie. Bowie, when he was a curly haired folk singer with a perm, we wanted somebody imposing who you would actually believe could intimidate Morpheus. And she does it just by being incredibly sweet. And you are always certain that she is far and away the most dangerous person on the screen at any point. I have dreams. Now. Her wings are practical with VFX augmentation. We made real wings, seven foot high wings that, that she's wearing, and then we augmented them with CGI to make them move and flutter as she did. We have two beloved characters. We have Kane, who is the caretaker of the House of Mystery. And we have Gregory the Gargoyle, both long established DC Comics characters that I took over and incorporated into Sandman with an enormous amount of love. I stole a lot of things when I was building Sandman. The idea that Kane and Abel, essentially the caretakers of the houses of secrets and mystery were the same Cain and Abel who had murdered each other 
in the Bible. That wasn't me, that was Alan Moore in an ancient issue of Swamp Thing. And I'd loved that idea. I'd loved the idea that these are entities who live in dreams and look after stories. And I lifted that completely and then just built on it over the 75 issues of Sandman. Kane is played by Sanjeev Bhaskar, and I don't know where casting people found a full-sized adult gargoyle, but whichever gargoyle they got to play Gregory delivers, I think, the performance of a lifetime. I thought about giving up. And there is Kirby Hal Baptiste as Death. She is Dream's big sister somebody who can speak truth to him, she can tell him what's going on. So what's interesting here is we took the death dialogue from the original comic, but we also went into a short story that I'd written called Winter's Tale, which was illustrated by the astonishing uh, Jeffrey Catherine Jones. And so death gets to talk not only about being current joyous death who understood what they did, but also she gets to talk about what it was like when she had to come to terms with that. When I was writing the comic, I wanted a death who would be there at the end, who would turn to me and say, you know, you really should look both ways before you cross that street, but who would do it with kindness. Somebody will be nice to meet. There have been a lot of literary deaths they are scary, they are imposing, some of them are skeletal, some of them are cold. I thought, I want to make a death who's there at the end just to say hi. So that was the death that I created with somebody nice. And Kirby pulls that off so well. Giving up. But I have a job to do, and I do it. Things have changed. So here we have Mason Alexander Park, who is playing Desire. And Mason contacted me on Twitter and they asked me who the casting director was. Now I was curious and I went to YouTube and watched some of Mason's videos and went, whoa, this performance is exactly what we're looking for. Thanks. Your eyes will tell me everything, every thought. Every feeling. Boyd Holbrook is a fabulous actor, but has a terrible problem, which is he doesn't actually have eyes, he, he has mouths. For most parts that he plays, he has to wear these prosthetic eyes over his eye mouths to cover up the fact that he doesn't have proper eyes, which coincidentally is what the Corinthian has. The Corinthian is a nightmare who does not have eyes, who is forever seeking the eyes of others, eating them using his own eye mouths and seeing what they see and experiencing what they experience. Boyd Holbrook, scariest man in the world. Every feeling. My creations do not... Beautiful shot there of the gates of ivory, the ones through which true dreams come and go. I think the production designers and the art department and the physical builders and everybody went over and above on that gate. It's astonishing. My creations do not walk amongst the living, killing mortals for pleasure. Oh, you don't think dreams can die? Let's find out. There we get to see the amazing John Cameron Mitchell. He plays Hal in the Doll's House episodes. He is the most glorious performer, sometimes performing in drag, and he sings and is astonishing. And there's even a uh, glorious duet in dreams with himself. That is what happens when you have a demon inside somebody trying to get out. This is from episode three, Dream a Little Dream of Me. This is from the Constantine story. And if you look really carefully, you can see Jenna Coleman as Joanna Constantine performing an exorcism. And there we get to see David Thewlis as John Dee destroying the Palace of Dreams, destroying the throne room, destroying everything. He's burning it all down using the ruby. In the comic, he's just standing there saying, I'm squeezing out your life and stuff. And here he's actually doing it. Everything is burning up around him while he's holding it. The place that we keep going, making this, figuring out how something that was created as a set of still pictures with word balloons 
if we're moving and if we're doing things, let's watch the Palace of Dream crumbling around him as he's destroying it. It represents destroying Morpheus's life and destroying everything that he's been trying to rebuild, and we're seeing it crumble. Nightmares do not belong in the waking world. Oh, it turns out I fit right in. We took the three witches, the three fates, and we did it incredibly straight. When you come to meet them in episode two, they're those same characters. They say the same things. We have the maiden, we have the mother, we have the crone. This is a moment in their initial appearance. And then they are going to visually separate and become three and have a conversation with Morpheus about where his lost things are. And over on the right, we have Mark Hamill, and he is playing Merv Pumpkinhead. He's basically in charge of putting things up and taking them down in the dreaming. Very practical. He's about as far from Lord Morpheus as you can possibly get. Dreams don't fucking die. That was Pat Oswalt saying fucking, who is playing Matthew the Raven, which proves that it is Pat Oswalt in that Raven costume. A lot of people might have thought we got like a very small raven-shaped actor, but no, we just got Patton to do it, dressed as a raven, very convincingly, and you know it's him because he swore. Die. It's so strange. I started writing Sandman in 1987. So watching things that have taken 36 years between conception and writing and what's happening now, it's unbelievable. But what's mostly unbelievable for me is how incredibly faithful it is and listening to lines that I wrote over three decades ago. So it took a long time to get here, but if we tried to get here earlier, we wouldn't have had this, where we can actually make Sandman properly. And people let us, and, uh, and we have.